I think we're going to get started here. Um, thank you so much for coming to our panel, Striking the Balance, Empowering Web Archivists and Researchers in Accessible Web Archives. I'm Kaylin Smith. I'm from Cambridge University Libraries, uh, where I'm head of digital preservation. But today, I'm, your, um, I'm the chair for this session. Uh, I'm really thrilled to be here with four absolutely brilliant people who are doing some really interesting work in web archiving. Uh, we have Leontine Talboom, also from Cambridge University Libraries, uh, Alice Austin from the University of Edinburgh, uh, Andrea Kochis from the University of uh, North London, and we're very grateful to have Tom Storr from uh, the National Archives in the UK, uh, representing the UK Government Web Archive, uh, who stepped in at the last moment to replace um, our other panel member, Mark Bell. So special thanks to Tom for, for joining <laughs> us as well. <laughs> Um, so in terms of how this session will run, each of our panelists will briefly introduce themselves and um, how they came to work with web archives, what perspectives they're coming from, um, and then we have um, a set list of questions that we'll go through. But we really want to keep this panel casual, really just a, uh, a chat about web archiving and our work. Uh, and we really want to hear from you as well, so we'll have plenty of time at the end for any questions, thoughts, comments. Um, I'm also aware that this is the last session before lunch, so I will do my best to keep us on track and end on time. Um, so without further ado, um, why don't we go to Alice and you can tell us more about your work. Um, hello, so I'm Alice Austin. I'm currently web archivist at the University of Edinburgh, thank you. Um, so I first came to uh, web archives as a researcher. Um, my PhD was on the Scottish independence referendum that terrifyingly happened 10 years ago this year. Um, so I started off looking at, at, online discourse played a really, really big part in, in that. Um, and so I started off looking at web archives as looking for traces of those conversations and the debates that happened. Could you press the little button? Thank you. Um, so I have grown up, if you like, using the UK Web Archive. Um, it's, it's my first introduction to web archives, and to me, it's still the first and most important web archive in my life anyway. Um, after using it as a researcher, I had a lot of questions about how collections are actually built um, and what goes into the sort of decision-making process about how they're organized. Um, my background prior to that is as an archivist. So I'm always kind of interested in that archival theory and how we kind of represent what it is that we do to, to researchers. I then um, joined the University of Edinburgh on the Archive of Tomorrow project, um, where we were looking at capturing online health discourse, kind of trying to answer the question of how do people use the internet um, to find, share, and discuss health information. Again, that really gave us an opportunity to think about how we make our work visible. Um, now I'm doing something quite different at the University of Edinburgh, um, which is trying to sort of embed web archiving as part of our natural web lifecycle management. Um, still using the UK Web Archive, because I am nothing if not loyal. Um, and we're, we're looking at um, trying to find ways to slim down our web estate potentially directing people to the UK Web Archive captures where we can, um, and really trying to raise the profile of web archives within the university. That's me. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we'll go back here um, to our previous slide. So Sorry. <laughs> forget that this says Mark Bell, and we'll hear from, <laughs> from Tom instead. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, hello everyone. Yeah, I'm Tom Storer. I'm the, uh, the head of web archiving at the National Archives, stepping in for Mark Bell. Um, so we, Mark and I have been working very closely over the last few years. Uh, Mark's focus has been on research, particularly big data and computational access to the web archive, um, and, um, and also aspects of kind of AI and machine learning. Um, my team are, we're a team of seven at the National Archives. We deliver the UK government web archive and a couple of other web archives, um, but we're going to focus on the UK government web archive today. Well, I am anyway. Um, <laughs> and um, it's basically, an, it's an archive of UK government websites and social media um, um, going back to uh, sort of the mid 90s. And um, we, it's a public access web archive um, in the UK. Um, but our scope is fairly limited to um, UK central government and um, public bodies. Thank you. Um, sorry. 
<laughs> so we're not going to hear from Alice again. Nope. We're going to go forward and hear from Leontine. <laughs> Hello, everyone. I'm Leontine Talboom, and um, my first introduction to web archives was during my PhD. So my PhD was a collaborative project between University College London and the National Archives in the UK, and I was looking at access to born digital archives. Um, as I was working with the National Archives, I had the opportunity to do a practical uh, side to the PhD. And I kept asking around, what material is accessible and can I use? What's more digital and accessible uh, within the National Archives? And very quickly, I ended up with the UK government web archive, which was great. Um, this led to work with Mark Bell um, around uh, finding different ways into the UK government web archive. And it led to an article um, around using Python notebooks to showcase a different way into uh, the UK government web archive outside of the keyword search. That's, that's normally where users start. Um, this then led to a software sustainability fellowship um, where I developed a computational access guide with the Digital Preservation Coalition. Um, basically, all the ideas that we got from working with the web archive kind of fed into that. Um, and then I ended up working, similar to Alice, um, on the Archive of Tomorrow, um, which was around collecting health discourse online, but instead of being based at the University of Edinburgh, I was based at Cambridge. Um, and that's also where, where I met Andrea. So <laughs> Andrea um, is, as she will talk about in a sec, um, she basically was a fellow who joined our project and um, came from a research perspective instead of being someone who came from more of an archiving perspective. So, yeah, that's me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Let's hear from Andrea now. Thanks for giving me the intro. <laughs> well, I enjoyed it. Hi, I'm Andrea Kocic, and um, as, as Leontine said, that I, I'm the imposter. I'm from the other side. Um, and I also find myself in, uh, in the intersection of the trading zone, because I'm a historian turned into data scientist. So I'm, I'm from all of the words uh, which intersect somehow here. Um, and I was one of the two researchers who joined uh, the, uh, the Cambridge side of the Archive of Tomorrow team to play with the collection. And I, I almost slipped and said data set. Uh, it would be a foreshadowing how I, I like to think about uh, uh, this. And originally, my plan was to, um, to build a classifier and, and see how we can experiment with the misinformation in connection to COVID uh, in, in the data set. Uh, and in the first stage of the project there, I got to mostly just to data cleaning and, uh, and mapping and topic modeling and overall understanding the data set. And I'm going to um, make the classifier itself uh, uh, when I join uh, uh, the National Library of Scotland, where I'm uh, moving to in a week. Um, <laughs> And um, the, the plan was if we can find out based on which wording of the credible sources what type of non-credible misinformation can spin off, like using the word jab or vaccine, which one is more likely to trigger those who, who can be triggered uh, by this conversation. Uh, but at the Library of Scotland, I'm going to turn it around. And because I face quite a lot of limitations as a researcher, uh, coming from my misunderstanding of what a web archive is, uh, I would, I'm hired to design user interfaces, gamified access, uh, visualizations, and in-person workshops to use the results to give more awareness um, about the web archive uh, to researchers, because that's my big takeaway, and I'm, I think, firing um, my munition quite early, that what, what is the most important in this conversation for me is managing the expectations of the researcher, what type of data they will find when they encounter this archive. That's great. Thank you. Um, so as you've seen from each of our panelists, they're coming from different perspectives, using different web archives. Um, so we'll move on to our questions now. Great. Um, so perhaps we can start off with the first one here, how do we communicate about web archives and their value? Um, I really like what you just said, Andrea, when you were speaking about um, playing with the collection, and it was such a um, kind of friendly way of putting that because web archives can be intimidating, especially if you're using them for the first time. Um, do you or any of the other panelists want to say um, anything about that or, or about communicating using web archives in a more 
um, open and uh, less intimidating way? I, I find it very important because how I see this is you can encounter the web archives in, from two directions. One is if you are coming with this data headset, which I have, and, and you want to do digital humanities and big data on it, or you are you know, a pen and paper researcher who just wants to find a newer collection. And if you are coming uh, to this stage with the digital mindset, you are going to be disappointed. Uh, not in every case, but at least at the legislation that I encountered with uh, the Archive of Tomorrow, because I couldn't do distant reading. I couldn't do uh, big data, big stats. Um, it was not what I expected. Uh, but if I change my mindset and imagine this data like a microfilm collection, okay, when you have to go be in the library, have to turn one uh, instance after the other, you cannot annotate it, you have to take paper notes, uh, you have to have the very traditional researcher mindset, then it's you know, a plentiful uh, um, resource. Um, and that's what I would like to, um, to show the users in the library, that you don't have to see the big picture. It's enough if you can cherry pick information and um, you find a story, you find an interesting bit, as you would do when you are doing your index research in a paper archive. Yeah. Can I just add something to that? I, I think Andreas also, um, just, just to give a little bit of context on how difficult it was for Andrea to work with this material, um, the UK legal deposit, kind of the non-print legal deposit, kind of limits data mining over the UK uh, web archive, and I think that's the case for a lot of web archives, um, which basically meant that we find a way to extract the metadata from the Archive of Tomorrow collection. Um, which Andrea then took and crawled all the URLs within that metadata again. So she basically crawled everything again. Very similarly, but uh, yesterday's poster Helena showed yeah. that research is again web scraped web archive data. Yeah. yeah, so that was that was a real challenge for Andrea. And coming from not having worked with web archives before, that was that was very challenging. Um, and communicating that to Andrea, like this is how a web archive works. Um, was was really difficult. Um, one of the things that really helped was the um, data sets for, oh, I always forget the name of it. Data sheets for data yes, sets. Yes, there we go. <laughs> data sheets for data sets, which we made as like part of this project. Mm -hmm. um, Andrea actually turned around and she said, and this was nearly at the end of her fellowship, she was like, I finally understand web archives. And I was like, why, well, I did a really bad job at explaining them to you. <laughs> um, so that, that was really interesting to see as well, how helpful that type of documentation can be for a researcher who's not familiar with web archives as a resource, so yeah. That's really interesting there, just to, just to pick up what you ended on and, and how there might be different entry points needed into a collection or just web archiving, broadly speaking. Um, I wonder if, Tom, if you want to come in and, and uh, say anything about that as leading a team at the National Archives and um, supporting researchers and using the UK government web archive? Of course, yeah. So, yeah, at, in our context, so we're the sort of the service provider, um, uh, if you like, of, of the, the UK government web archive as a service to researchers um, and to the, you know, to the public and so on. And I, I think um, in the National Archives um, context, um, the sort of the value of the web archive is kind of con in a constant state of being realized. Um, it's, um, you know, it's extremely contemporary, as most web archives are. It's, um, we, we, we publish content that was, was only harvested um, a, a week ago. Um, and um, the, one of the aspects of the value of the web archive is the context that the web archive provides to other records that we hold. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so um, I think we've, we've not really started to scratch the surface on that front. Um, mm -hmm. The, um, the, the value up to this point has largely been to do with providing continued access to government information online, so, which is a very valid use case, and it's one that is really important to our mission, um, basically reducing broken links and trying to allow people to find X, Y, and Z on the, on the web. Um, but um, it's, um, it's really... Uh, I think kind of communicating the value, particularly in a sort of a, a, 
a world where digital digital services are um, really quite slick these days. Um, one of the big challenges is um, it sort of explaining what's in the archive, but also helping users to use it in a way that doesn't frustrate them and make them sort of turn their back on it and walk away. Um, you know, so there's a quite there's quite a challenge there to 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 break down um, to break down those barriers and sort of reduce the entry um, requirements, if you like, for the service. Um, so yeah, so I've been working with Mark for um, for a couple of years on ways of conceptualising how we how we provide um, access to the data in other ways and um, reduce those barriers to to use. Thanks. Um, and then Alice, you have a really, I think, unique position because you use the UK Web Archive, but you're not based at the Legal Deposit Library in the UK. And just want to know if um, if you want to come in and, and talk about how you communicate about your work and support users, whether they're staff at the university or mm -hmm. researchers. Yeah, I think um, another thing where we maybe I differ from from you guys is that I don't have a very technical <laughs> background at all. So I've I've learned an awful lot in a few years um, about how websites are built and how web archives work. And for me, I think one of the, the real values of web archives is the potential for creating a more representative historical record. Um, my first ever job in archiving was uh, in a medical archive setting where you very rarely hear patient voices, you very rarely hear marginalized communities' voices. So. That, that to me is, I think, a huge value of web archives, but also comes with a lot of um, responsibility in how we communicate what, what it is exactly that we're trying to be representative of. Um, we found during the Archive of Tomorrow collection when we were collecting and putting together collections, you know, this is very much my version of this particular condition or a community around a particular medical issue. Um, it's my version of it. It's not necessarily how they would see themselves. So that's always interesting to think about from, from that perspective. Um, I think there's also a very practical and not boring, that's not the right word, but yes, much more straightforward um, value of web archives towards thinking about, so from a, from a University of Edinburgh's perspective, we're trying to slim down our web estate and think really critically about what actually we need to keep online, um, both from a management perspective, but also from a sustainability perspective. Where do we not need to be keeping older websites, older content live? Um, and that's been really, really useful to kind of try and communicate with people at the university who are coming at it from a completely different perspective. So there's sort of compliance legislative sides, but also the kind of maybe softer historical heritage value side as well. Thanks. Um, I wonder if before we move on, would you prefer to have questions on this question now or wait until the end? Do you? Shall we wait until the end? We're wait until the end, okay. Um, okay, so. I think the next question can go in a few different directions, but what, what are your thoughts on uh, the intended audience or user of web archives, and is that something that can even be defined? Can I say a little bit about that from a more wider born digital archiving perspective? So during my PhD, um, um, I looked at, with a few colleagues at the National Archives, at who the, and I know this is a bit of a dreaded word, but who the designated community is of the National Archives, um, which is technically everyone, um, which they, which if you look at the guidance around designated community, should not be what you put down, everyone. <laughs> um, <laughs> so that makes it a little bit difficult. Um, but it meant that we explored it in a, in a different way where we categorized different types of um, audiences. So we had the more traditional user, um, which was someone who just came in and looked at stuff one by one. Um, and then you had the computational user, like Andrea would be, who just wants to, just sees it as a da data set and just wants to use it as a data set. Um, but then we had a third category, and this is the one that I really think that we should start catering more and more towards, which is like the digitally curious, and like Tom already t uh, t um, touched on this as well, where it's this group that 
knows that there's computational methods out there to use, but they're not the person who can actually use them. Um, and it's like, how do, we, how do we find the balance between giving them opportunities to actually do that type of stuff, um, but also not feed in like, to all of our time in, in just catering towards one, one specific user or one specific group? Um, so yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's what we are trying to do now with my fellowship uh, at the library. Very cool. The two directions. So one, we, we try to uh, create workshops which will use technical skills, entry-level technical skills on web archive data and information. So it's kind of bridges the gap or overcomes that intimidation mm -hmm. what the single user who suddenly sees that interface and gets freaked out mm -hmm. feels. Uh, that in intimidation which uh, Kayla mentioned at the very beginning. Um, and on the other hand, we also uh, try to cater to this general audience because especially uh, the Archive of Tomorrow is about health. That's a thing which is very personal and social at the same time. It's very intimate but very public at the same time. That's a topic which if we try to dig back our collective memory of, of the pandemic, we can bond over and create communities. And that's what we, how we try to use the data set for outreach, to, to feel connected via the topic which you archived and we live through. Um, these are the two versions we are trying to go. One towards the, uh, the researcher who, who wants to be less intimidated, and the other, the general public, who is just there, and we have to somehow grasp other uh, way uh, they sleep. And also, I think, um, coming from a very kind of UK web archive focused, it is a, a national collection. So thinking about cultural entitlement, I think we do need to to make sure that we are kind of trying to open up as much as we can to people who might not necessarily see themselves as users of web archives. How we do that, I think, is a different challenge altogether. Um, but I'm also really excited by the idea that this is all new. Um, we have no idea <laughs> what kind of weird and wonderful uses people are going to have of it in the future. Um, I think there's, there's definitely uses of sort of traditional analog archives that would definitely not have been anticipated at the time that they were created and collected. So I think that's, that's something that's quite exciting, seeing, seeing how people want to use these resources in the future and kind of trying to keep an open mind and keep those open channels of communication so that people know that this exists is probably the, the first thing we have to do. Um, not, not easy, though. I wonder, Lanty and Alice, if you want to say anything about your experience as web archivists and communicating with creators of, of content online that you captured as part of the Archive of Tomorrow project and explaining to creators what a web archive is, why yeah. are you looking to include that content in this particular collection? We had a, uh, we were really lucky on the project that we had a license officer, so someone who basically went and contacted people about their websites being captured. So within the framework of uh, the UK, we are allowed to capture websites that are published within the UK, but not necessarily make them openly accessible, except when um, the creator of the website signs a license. Um, and it was so interesting to hear from her how um, difficult it was for her to communicate the web archive as like something that was good <laughs> in a way. So a, a lot of people were very skeptical about the web archive. And there was also, um, we even had difficulties with more official uh, sources such as the NHS, um, who basically said, we, we don't really want it to be openly accessible because we're really worried that people will find outdated information within the web archive and that we are that they would feel liable for that. Um, I don't know if Alice wants to add on. To yeah, that. it was it was really interesting to see the difference between what our expected sort of reasons for hesitation or wariness maybe were, and then what people actually kind of expressed. So, personally, I wouldn't have thought about ad revenue being a concern, mm -hmm. um, but people were concerned that oh well, if something's captured in the web archive and I make it. Um, accessible, are, are people going to go and look at that version rather than the version that I can potentially make money from? Um, there was also a lot of conversations that were brought up about how things were going to be described. So 
Archive of Tomorrow, the kind of subtitle to that project was Health Information and Misinformation. Um, so we had some people who were concerned that their site was going to be kind of labelled as misinformation or, in some cases, hate speech. Um, and so that, that kind of really forced us to think again about what is it that we're trying to achieve and how are we communicating what legal deposit is and what the point of it is and, and what is you know, what is the web archive for and who is it for. Um, that was very, very eye-opening, I think. And that's been really useful to take forward to thinking about working with the University of Edinburgh and where we're, we are hoping to achieve um, an umbrella licence for all University of Edinburgh content that has been captured in, within the UK web archive to make that accessible. Um, one concern has been, well, does it show up in, in a Google search? Um, again, not something I would have thought of, um, but, but has been really, really helpful in helping us to sort of anticipate what people's concerns might be about content being made, made available in a web archive or even captured in the first place. Is this something, Tom, that comes up with the UK government web archive? Do you have creators who reach out to the team to ask, um, you know, why are you capturing my blog or whatever it is? Um, um, yeah, it is to a certain extent. I mean, um, from a, a content creator's perspective, I think it's, it's always quite surprising how um, still um, we find um, uh, that, that, that people are unaware that we're archiving their content. Um, um, even though we've sort of been around for quite a long time, we do fair, a fair amount, a reasonable amount of sort of uh, knowledge, knowledge raising and, 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 and talk and discussion and that kind of thing. I mean, um, we, we, don't get, we don't get the same level of sort of um, pushback or scepticism, I suppose, that a lot of other web archives get. Um, and I think when it comes... Yeah, sort of. I think civil servants, in particular, tend to be quite aware that the content they're publishing is um, <clears throat> is going to is going to remain. You know, is going to be scrutinised, and um, it, it's normally been. You know, a lot of it's been through a few layers of sign off normally before it's made public. Anyway, mm -hmm. that's not to say that there aren't some areas where. We, we have difficulty, um, so we have a takedown policy, and it kind of relates to the next question, really, about legislation and, mm -hmm. and, and so on. But, um, yes, the, the takedown policy is a really important way in which we can continue to archive um, websites and give, give meaningful access to them, um, but um, on occasion take down content from public view mm -hmm. where um, perhaps there's something that's that's been published inadvertently or something like that. So um, it's, we found that a very useful mechanism um, to, um, I suppose, reassure people of, of, of what we're doing. One of the things I was thinking about when you were speaking is um, on the, when I was working on the Archive of Toronto Project, I recall hearing um, with the UK government web archive there was concern around users finding that content um, through a search engine and thinking that that was, um, I guess, up-to-date information about the pandemic or relating to the pandemic in some way, but it's from an archive. Yeah. And I, I'm just wondering if you could share more about that and kind of what led you to, I think, um, not indexing that data or at that time. I, I think that was the, the outcome. Yeah, that's right. So it really comes back to the intended audience point, really. Um, and, you know, yeah, I mean, it's, it's for everyone. Yeah, it's um, particularly a UK government web archive. It's about it's about heritage, but it's also about accountability. And um, you know, so our, our our impulse, our default position, is to make it available as openly as possible. Um, um, when the pandemic hit, um, it quickly became apparent that um, you know we had, I think, half a million results in in Google, and we were getting something like sixty percent of our traffic about 100,000 users a, a month um, into the archive. 60% of that was through Google. And um, it quickly dawned on us in you know, March 2020 that, um, hey, there's, it's very likely that, that someone's going to be searching for some COVID advice or COVID, um, uh, yeah, say COVID symptoms or something that's, that was a rapidly changing um, thing at that stage. And they may well stumble, stumble on a something that's 10 days out of date. Um, so yeah, we took the decision to remove it from Google at that point. And um, 
I mean, just the other day I was talking to someone about how there is actually still, still some residual content in Google, um, mysteriously. Um, <laughs> don't really understand it myself, but the person I was talking to owned a website. Um, they were saying, um, oh, we really don't think that you should have content from our website at all in Google. Um, a couple of weeks earlier, I was talking to someone else saying, oh, when will our content appear in Google? Mm. So there's a sort of... Um, there's a sort of uh, tension between those two, between those two extremes, if you like. Um, uh, but at the moment, we've opted to, to to try and block it as much as we possibly can. Thanks. Um, and I, I just want to pick up too on something that you were saying, Alice, about concerns around whether or not, um, I, I guess, a creator thought you were labeling something or tagging mm. something as misinformation or as um, truthful or fact, and that really wasn't the. Um, intent of the, of the project to do any sort of decisions like that or to assign any kind of um, um, yeah tag that would label it one way or the other and just wanted to see if you or, or Lane team wanted to say anything more about that and maybe um, anything about the risks of collecting some content as well mm. that is perhaps damaging or could be seen as damaging in some way. Yes, and, and Nicola was speaking a little about this earlier in terms of um, content advisories. So we, we did collect, so I worked on a sub-collection within um, the Archive of Tomorrow project around uh, trans health, um, which is a horrifically hotly debated uh, topic in the UK at the moment. Um, there is a lot of, I, I suppose, could be described as volatile content, um, we thought it was really important to reflect the good and the bad. Um, it's part of being a trans person in the UK is trying to navigate that, that landscape. Um, but we also didn't want to put people in harm's way, so we had to think about um, what, what does that actually mean in, in practice. Um, again, I suppose it comes back to what is it that we're trying to achieve with a web archive? What is it that we're trying to achieve with a collection like this? Are we trying to offer, um, you know, a reliable source of information or are we trying to document things as they are? I think that's potentially where, amongst the project, there was differences between people from library backgrounds and archival backgrounds. Um, as an archivist, I, like I say, worked in a medical uh, archive. Nobody work going into to the archive and looking at, say, 14th century cures involving leeches would necessarily need to be told, don't try this at home. Um, so that kind of level of advisory isn't required in the same way because you're in a physically different space. You're physically walking into a reading room. Mm. I think with the web, it can be so seamless mm. that it's hard to make those distinctions. And, so, and, and also there's very little opportunity for somebody accessing that information to potentially talk to a curator and find out how it's been preserved and why. Um, so that was, that was a really big concern for us. It was such an interesting aspect of the project. Um, and there's a lot more to be done, done around it, I think. I don't know if you or want to... From the researcher side, uh, that's where the information is. Mm. That's what we want to research. Mm. And that's where I think your responsibility should be framing it for us, contextualizing the data sheets uh, and, and trusting us that we also have our ethical standards not yeah. to abusing that. The question here, again, uh, the wider audience, how they will react, mm -hmm. it has to be communicated in a different way than yeah. how the researcher uh, gets yeah. the information. But as you said, if I'm going for 18th century material, I know what to expect yeah. because I was already introduced to this. Mm -hmm. I guess the more framing, the more labeling, the more data sheets accompanying information is out, the clearer it becomes that what I'm seeing is a curated and not value, uh, you know, attached, clear valued source of information. Mm. Do you want I, oh, sorry. sorry, I was just going to say, I think that's a bit of a challenge with the web archive because there are lots of different ways to access that. Yeah. So if you're coming in through the curated collection, you know, as a researcher, you've got that mentality. If you are kind of stumbling upon that, whether through linked sites or something else, you might not be kind of con considering that, that aspect of it being curated in that way. Is it technically possible to, to label an info pop-up box to these? 
Nicola can speak to you <laughs> more about this, but uh, I think your point earlier was possible but incredibly difficult. difficult yes. um, yeah, and very expensive, expensive. <laughs> which is a concern. The, the thing to come back to Alice's uh, point as well is that the, the balance that I find really difficult in the Archive of Tomorrow project is we had the opportunity to include more communities and include more voices than we'd ever than we would have otherwise because there was free web archivists and trying to strike the balance between protecting those groups and but also including them within the web archives was really really difficult so there's a lot of trans health is, is a good example of that there's a lot of forums out there um for help mm -hmm. um that may not be seen as official help but is a really important part of that community um and it was like those really interesting conversations between do we capture this or do we not capture this? And like where where does that lie? Because um, with it being a web archive and having that seamless um, way of entering it, it's just it's just a really difficult question mm -hmm. to answer because that whole ethical side comes into it as well. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, we did decide to capture a, a number of them. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it's still just... It's just really difficult. And, then, and I, I can talk about this for hours, as you know. <laughs> um, but another thing that came up with that little mini sub-collection um, was the fact that there's a lot of sites out there which talk about how to access hormone treatments, for example, out with... Sorry, that's a Scottish word. Uh, outside of the um, supervision of a medical expert. So... There's potentially an argument, and it is such a toxic area in the UK at the moment, there's potentially an argument that people could be legally putting themselves at risk um, and encouraging, you know, bad, bad medical practices which would, would put them at risk of um, criminal prosecution. So how do we capture the fact that this, these conversations are happening but ensure that we're not therefore providing evidence to somebody who then wants to prosecute someone for sharing that information. It's such a minefield. Mm. Uh, thank you for all those thoughts. Um, why don't we move on to the topic uh, or the question of legislation and whether or not this could hinder the use of web archives. Um, we've been talking about two different web archives, the UK Web Archive, which is uh, a legal deposit initiative in the UK and the UK Government Web Archive. Um, does anyone, is anyone particularly keen to kick us off here on this uh, question? Yes. <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> sure. Yeah. So, um, yeah, we we are fortunate at the UK Government Web Archive. Um, the the Public Records Act um, allows us um, to provide open access to our archive. Um, I suppose um, it, th that's not to say that we can provide open access to the data in all its forms. Mm -hmm. um, but um, we are at least able to. Um, uh, uh, be a default open on the web archive um, and provide things like full text search and 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 so on um, one I mean this is a kind of a question that we've grap tried to be, tried to grapple with many times over the last few years and it's um, uh, as I mentioned before we have a takedown policy which is one of the um, main ways in which we manage our sort of legal but also ethical um, constraints um, around the archive and um, there's definitely still there remains a challenge around providing large scale data sets of our, of our data um, for kind of quote unquote downstream takedown mm -hmm. issues mm -hmm. so where, um, where an emergent issue is identified um, uh, once you've um, r once you've basically released large volumes of data um, as we know, you know, there's no way to get that back. Um, so there's a there's actually a project at the moment that we're we're looking at around um, sort of um, non-consumptive use of our data in a way that um, can can deal or sort of smooth around smooth over some of those problems about about takedown and um, hopefully enable use at scale and um, it, computationally as well. Um, why don't we go to Andrea next because I was always um, just so fascinated about the kinds of things that you were experiencing as a researcher on the Archive of Tomorrow Project and you know just 
reactions like why is why is this a thing like why are we doing it this way um i was really like a fish out of water just you know the newborn <laughs> figuring everything out i expected what i expected that i join you i just open up something download all the data and do my stuff and it, it was not possible and as the previous panel discussed there are ways to bypass this legislation um because for my project, the one by one access sitting on the spot was not the right solution, um, but it comes up with new obstacles, which then has to be solved and has to be considered. So um, I was really, really grateful for the metadata, which was beautifully prepared. Um, and from there, I could work, uh, I, I could finish the job I was hired for, mm -hmm. but um, but with uh, strong limitations. For example, obviously, if you are Rescraping uh, the URLs from a list of extracted URLs, it's, you cannot do uh, a temporal comparison. You can't do a diachronic research because you see only the moment when you can scrape it. Therefore, it again limited how to see how the narratives changed, for example, which was the, the first aim. Then uh, there were tremendously low to dead links already by that time. Websites obviously changed um, when I um, when I scraped them uh, back, and um, yeah, these were the, the major um, the, the two major obstacles which had to navigate uh, my research question. Um, and you know, maybe I was the one who was very blatantly ignorant to what I am going into, um, but might be I might be a symptom of a larger misunderstanding of what you can expect. And mostly, uh, not only these expectations, but the legislation was, was absolutely not understandable for me. I didn't understand which document I can access, why I can access that, why I can't access the other one, why can I take that home, why I can't take that home. Or oh, the other problem which it caused, uh, it was spotty. And I didn't know it was, I didn't understand how it was spotty. The data sheet again was brilliant because it told me uh, which geographic region was more represented, which topic was, which genre, which format was more represented in the data. So I could work with that. But when I just introduced the big interface, I don't know what, what is behind. It's kind of a black box situation for, for me as a researcher. I love how you um, so beautifully prepared metadata, which I think is something that we all dream about. Um, <laughs> I want to touch you with that. <laughs> Do you find that, or, or did you find that the legislation impacted the research questions that you were looking to? Definitely, yeah. yes. Um, it's again, you can go to, like the traditional historical research, you know who wrote something, you want to find that person's or that topic's relevant document, and then you can find it, and it's very limited what you can do with that. It's a different mindset than how I originally wanted to look at the question. And Leontine and or Alice, do you want to comment on this question? No? Yeah, I was going to say it's, it's something of a double-edged sword, I think, the, the UK legislation, um, in that it, like Leontine says, enables the collection of anything in the UK web space, um, published in the UK web space, but restricts access to it. So um, it's wonderful on one hand because there is just so much that is in scope, um, but it has a very strict barrier to it, um, which doesn't really reflect how the internet works. Um, so again, when we were collecting, it's it's hard to say where the boundary between um, conversations happening in the UK and conversations happening in the US, for example, is, um, and to try and reflect that within the UK Web Archive. I think one thing which is always interesting is to think about what can't we show in an archive, whether that's a web archive or, or otherwise. Um, so, yeah, it's like something of a, a double-edged sword in that respect. I just find it especially sad that you were able to not work on that temporal side of the, mm. of the data Everybody set. Everybody finds it sad. Yeah, because <laughs> like that's, that's, in my opinion, such an interesting part of, the, of web archives in general. I know that we did a project as, as part of a study group uh, a few years ago where we did graph networks of the UK government web archive, and that was so interesting to see how departments changed over time. Um, but yeah, we couldn't have done that without having that temporal uh, side to the to the data set, yeah. Yeah, 
Um, I want to leave us some time um, for audience questions, but for our last question here, I wonder if you could just uh, give us some thoughts on whether or not web archives can be seen as objects, and then we'll go to audience questions. Um, do you want to start us off, Andrea, and then we'll kind of work our way across? I'm unsure I understand the question. <laughs> <laughs> Why don't you start, Alice? <laughs> sure. Um, so I think we've, we've touched on this a little bit, um, but the archive object, the archive as an object, has its own history. Um, and I think this is something that, you know, quote-unquote traditional analog archives have really embraced. Um, and I think it's something we've kind of touched on a little bit with, like, the the data sheets for data sets. Oh, I got it now. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I think we, the challenge is really for how we can kind of foreground that information um, and those considerations. I think one thing that the Archive of Tomorrow gave us a great opportunity was to actually speak to people like you, Andrea, um, and actually speak to the re researchers who were using this. Um, it's still very, very difficult, though, to present that material alongside the actual collection, especially when we're talking about the UK Web Archive, and which, which is so vast. Um, within the UK Web Archive system, it's hard to show when something was added to a crawl, when something was added to a collection, why, who by. Um, so I think there's the sort of... Um, the life and the afterlife of the archive itself is something we need to kind of work on explaining and showing a little bit more. Yeah. What, what I really like as well, and Tom mentioned this as well, is how um, the web archive or like the collection of a web archive sits alongside other collections that people have. So not only alongside other web archives and why they've collected a slightly different mm -hmm. uh, set. So like the UK government web archive and the UK web archive have overlap. And that to me is just fascinating and like how that how that happened and as a researcher you're not really aware of that until you dive a little bit deeper into it but what you were saying as well Tom like how it sits along other government records is really fascinating because it gives a slightly different picture of stuff um, so yeah I would love to see more of that type of research too yeah absolutely I mean I think that that's that's kind of the point I mean the the, the fact that we've been designing and we've been archiving for for years and years and years for, for everyone, um, there's very much been a focus on, you know, kind of getting the archive built. Um, and, um, you know, we've had a, there's a, I think from an access perspective, there's still very much a sort of an individual page, individual resource focus that um, uh, makes, makes, the exper makes the experience in many ways a kind of like very atomized Sort of like lots of individual objects that make up make up the the entirety of the of the archive, but there are I mean there are some some excellent sort of tools and things we've been doing lately around um, you know looking at the looking at it as an ag aggregate object you know an aggregation of 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 things and as a, um, a, a as an overall collection that that gives you a, a view of of some of the shape of of of, of that. Um, and you know, like the, the change over time is a really interesting point of view. That's sort of um, individual how individual resources move around and 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 change or not over time. But also tools like you know, um, like Solar Wayback and the Glam Workbench and um, and so on are um, are really really useful in this respect because they move us away from that like extremely valid. Um, like wanting to find a single resource uh, a use case to uh, a, a viewing that viewing the object as a yeah as a sort of as a as a constantly evolving record in itself as a whole the, at the whole web archive level um, so I think um, yeah that's a really um, that's an area of that we we know we need to do more in and we know we um, will continue to to explore. All right. Um, do you want to add anything, Andrea, or shall we go to no, I'm questions? No, I'm perfect agreement with you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, does anyone have any questions for our panelists? Yes. Um. Thank you. Um, what level of objects do you describe in your catalog systems? 
So do you do the, the individual websites or the special collections or individual resources? Uh, so at National Archives, we do website level. Um, so um, yeah, it's quite a high, quite a high level, um, and we don't go, we don't go, go beneath that. Um, and with the UK Web Archive, it can vary, I think. Um, so we have um, collection level. Um, we have the, the sort of sub-collection, curated sub-collections, or curated collections. Then within that, you can have sub-collections. Um, and then each individual target, so each kind of seed URL is also described. That can vary from a entire domain um, to a single page. Um, so there's quite a lot of variation there, quite a lot of granularity if you want it to be, um, which can be a good thing and a bad thing. So some collection, sub-collections may be entire domains and some sub-collections may be single pages within domains. Hello. Um, yeah, I had a sort of follow-on question to that, which was thinking about the empowering researchers bit and the size of web archives, where I think sometimes now we're getting the, the, the feedback that kind of what we've created is perhaps too big to be useful, and sort of how, you know, kind of work, what the opportunities and tools and developments might be um, to support researchers in kind of getting from the really huge to now I've got a useful collection. I can work with. Can I go? Yeah. Um, so when I was doing work on the UK government web archive, I can remember starting with the um, search interface, which you can go into quite a detail on. But if you just type in like something like prime minister, you get 20 million results, I think it is. It's like, well, I'm not going to go through them one by one. <laughs> that's not, that's not going to be useful. Um, so Mark and I worked on a bunch of uh, Jupyter notebooks um, to like kind of answer that question of like, okay, if you're interested in like a specific topic or a specific time period or something other specific, you can limit that huge data set down to something that's a lot more workable. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know if that's the most sustainable way of doing it, but I know that other people have also worked Glam Workbench being a really good example of it worked with that type of stuff. Um, so yeah. Can I also add to that? That's that's also what I'm doing for the library. And I'm also promised to, to make Jupyter Notebooks. But we know that it's, again, uh, just for the not intimidated, quite technical researchers. It's a very subset of users who can, who can make sense of that. So what the other way we would go is, uh, is make it, I mean, that search, and search interface is, is scary. That, that is very intimidating uh, to to have thematic, story based, one case study, one example uh, interface into the collection. So that's kind of an example you can find here. If you want to go further, search this. Uh, that's the type of information you will you will bump into if you go this direction. That type of you know smelly, colorful. Uh, reimagining of that interface, which which I see myself experimenting with how to build that. Yeah. And personally, if I had all the money and all the resources and all the time <laughs> in the world, um, one thing I would love to see would be the ability for users of the web archive to create their own curated collections, um, pulling from, from different places, because they're, they're going to have different needs. They might want to compare things across different collections in ways we haven't even thought of. Um, that would be amazing if anyone could build that for me. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe next um, next conference we'll yeah. see that. Um, so yeah, I get to work now. Um, any other questions? Oh yeah, Sarah. Is this one? Yeah. Um, so I've got an archive of tomorrow question. Just with the um, just to say, I, I did work on the project as well, so it's a bit sneaky. But now that there's been uh, a bit of time and distance, I wonder, Leontine and Alice, if there were an archive of tomorrow part two, what you think the main goals and objectives of that would be and what would you focus on? May, yeah. May I add the wish list? <laughs> <laughs> I would like to see um, geographical representation, mm -hmm. so proportional collection. Mm -hmm. um, also in the times, types of media is accessible mm -hmm. and also 
what a region is covered more in order to be able to make any type of comparison. Now there, there's our answer. But um, <laughs> yeah, I follow on project. I think there's so much more to explore around, not necessarily, again, not necessarily around collecting, but also just around those questions that we've posed during during this panel where it's like how do we find the balance between including people but also not um in any way um doing that in a damaging way like how do we um how do we communicate that we're a web archive and like people shouldn't be skeptical about like being part of that like signing a license for that type of stuff it's more around those types of questions um, that I would be interested in exploring, not not necessarily um, collecting more more material. Um, so yeah, yeah, I, I'm similar. I think I'm again all the time. Money and resources would be um, to to be able to invite other people who are not maybe archive professionals who are not necessarily in our our world. I mean, f for one thing. It would be great to have some um, other languages represented in the collections because English is not the only language in the UK, but I think the, the, the collection we built is very English focused. So it would be good to see, to, to find other routes for other people to give us their collections um, and, and also researchers to, to be able to work more closely with researchers and say, well, what are you looking at? What are the websites that you're doing your own scraping on and, and where can we take take in those seed lists and, and kind of work that way. It screams for a focus group. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, we're out of time, and I just want to say thank you so much to our panelists for sharing your experience and, and with the audience and just being really open about your work as well. Um, and can you please join me with a round of applause? Thank you, thank you for sharing. <laughs> thank you.